So. <clears throat> So I did some. Uh, this is this court. Oh, we're finishing. <laughs> what do we do? Life span development, right? Last week, well, that was seemed like it was like four months ago. Last week, <laughs> so we finished life span development. Uh, I'm gonna open our test up. Thirty questions. You know, I'd like to get to at this point. Um, I'll put that together tonight and open it up tomorrow morning for you all to take. Well, we'll do like a week, like next Wednesday, we'll make it free or something. Is that cool? You all know how to do all that by now. We just do the three chapters that we did up until uh, Wednesday. And uh, then we only have one more exam after this, so it doesn't look like there'll be a, an exam on all the chapters we covered, but there'll be four, four exams to give you a grade on, and you'll you know continue to have the, the assignments that we'll do. So I'll, I'll get that ready and proceed. But now we're on to social psychology. And social psychology is um, like psychodynamic psychology. Uh, it's something that I personally find very fascinating and interesting. And um, I'm, I'm excited to talk about it because there's a lot of cool stuff in social psych. And, um, and also, I'm teaching this course. I've taught this course for a long time. And I'm, I'm about to teach it this winter. And uh, so, um, you know, I, I, I pulled out some old stuff that I put together, some old uh, slides that I put together, and I compiled some stuff to put together more in, in this way. So that's what we're doing. Social psychology, so you can look at it and see this. So I'm going to come. Uh, I'm going to present. This is, might be a little different style than usual than we've been doing, but I'm going to do some a little more close reading of some things with you to introduce you to this topic. Are there any questions about lifespan development? Everybody good. So up until this point, if, well, social psychology, I, I mean, psychodynamic psychology, maybe this isn't so true, but we've really looked at empirical psychology. So empirical psychology, like the, 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 the most uh, empirical of, of the psychologies of schools of thought would be behaviorism. So we looked at behaviorism rather closely. And we looked at... Um, um, the more uh, physical psychology, which is neuroscience or biological neuroscience, and remember that's reductionism, mechanism, and materialism. That would be like explain, both of these explain everything down to the individual. The third thing we really looked at is based on something called rationalism. And what is rational, like when one's rational, or when this term rationalism, we use it this way in philosophy, Rationalism means you're, you're thinking about it. You're using your, your mind. You're, it's, like, it's another word for cognition. So rationalism is the cognitive psychology. But all three of these psychologies, the empirical psychology of behaviorism, the material psychology of biological neuroscience, and the rational psychology of cognition, all of these are looking primarily at the individual's thinking. And something that's absent in this is context. And social psychology is all about context. Social psychology is the idea that, um, taken from the Gestalt psychologists. Remember the Gestaltists? The earliest social psychologists coming from, they were mostly European Jews who were escaping the fascist regimes that were popping up in Europe in the early 20th century, and they were escaping that and going to places like Canada and the United States. And um, a lot of these European Jews were gestalt psychologists. So the history of, of social psychology is deeply rooted in gestalt. And if, if I, I'm going to throw up an image here. 
let's see. This is, these are the topics we're going to look at. We're going to, I'm going to take you to a history. That's what we're starting right now, a history of social psychology. We'll look at some research methods. Then we're going to look at Gestalt psychologist Fritz Heider and his idea of attribution theory and also cross-cultural attribution theory, how, how this idea of how we attribute causes and reasons to things shifts from culture to culture. We'll talk about collectivist cultures and individualist cultures, so that's mostly like Eastern cultures and Western cultures, European Western cultures, and Eastern, Far Eastern, and Middle Eastern cultures. Are, uh, there's differences in the cultural customs that affect how people come to think, feel, and act. Uh, we're going to look at some social psychology of attraction, males and females, and what they find in different uh, norms of attract of, of a, a physical attraction to, towards one another, or partners, choosing partners, different reasons for choosing partners. Uh, we're going to look at conformity. So um, you know this pressure you may feel, and maybe even sometimes the trouble you get into when you're out with a group of friends and you find yourself doing things that you never would dream that you'd actually be doing and you probably would never do if you were on your own. And a lot of kids around, you know, in adolescence end up in, in trouble and uh, maybe even have lifelong regrets or maybe even die in some cases due to um, social conformity, social pressures, doing things uh, it's a very fascinating aspect of things. Conformity. So we're going to look at conformity. We're going to look at obedience to authority. This is, again, grew out of this idea of um, understanding how people obey authority and how they find themselves doing things that they otherwise would never do when they're commanded to do so by someone that they perceive of as having some sort of authority or some sort of official capacity. And that grows, again, a lot of this research goes, grows out of uh, the atrocities of fascism in, in Europe in the mid-20th century. So a lot, of this, a lot of this obedience authority research comes out of um, uh, the Holocaust and the uh, and Nazi and uh, Italian fascism and Spanish fascism in Europe. Um, we're going to look at the bystander effect, which is... Very interesting phenomenon that we're seeing over and over today. The idea that someone's getting attacked on a subway train. And media psychology, we're all over looking into this today, this phenomenon that people are taking out their phones and their cameras and they're recording the incident from ha uh, that's happening, like an attack on a subway or someone getting beat up on the street. But they're not calling 911. They're just watching it happen. There's just some curious psychology behind this, the bystander effect. And then... Finally, we're going to get to one of my favorite books in social psychology by Robert Cialdini. It's called Persuasion, the Psychology of Influence. And that is, uh, I'm going to walk you through that book. It's a book that is one of my favorite books in psychology. And it's, uh, the, I recommend it to everyone. But you're going to see why it's so exciting once we look at it. Um, it goes through five basic principles of getting people to say yes to your request. And once you tap into this and you see the scientific research in this, I mean, this book is required reading when you go to marketing school, advertising school, business school, uh, and social psychology. Cialdini was a social psychologist, and he really broke a lot of the codes of what people do when you walk into, say, a used car, or any car sales lot, a used car sales lot, a brand new car sales lot. He went undercover. And he found all the tricks and maneuvers that they learn to make you more likely to say yes to what they want you to say yes to. And that extends itself to voting, you know, to who you're going to say yes to, how the candidates manipulate their command of your uh, vote, uh, sales, it, 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 like... Um, even down to everyday life of dealing with people, this book is incredible. So we're going to go over all that stuff. So that's a broad outline of the topics. So let's look at history. History, 
you have kind of like found me. So the history, one of the earliest, we're going to look, you, you all know that Wilhelm Wundt is the founder of European psychology, the father of European psychology. And we all learned in this class so far that he was a proponent of experimental psychology, using the experimental method. We're looking at um, re reaction times, stimulus, how the mind organizes things. What many folks don't realize is that when, at the end of Wilhelm Wundt's life, he wrote a book called Volker's Psychology. So we're going to go through these. Volker's Psychology. Whoops. There he is. And um, you can actually ac access this book online. And I made an, a link to it. You can pull up these slides on the Moodle. And this is what I was trying to pull up on my Kindle to, to read to you. This is the, um, the Elements of Folk Psychology. And I, I want to read a little bit from his preface uh, for you to, to get a, a, a handle on what he's talking about. But before we read the preface, I want to show you the topics in this book. Because maybe when you're thinking of Wundt, you're thinking about the idea of introspection and cognitive perception, the idea of how the mind organizes um, stimulus into perception. If you remember, Wundt would set a metronome and click it and ask people to rate whether they feel at different tempos in the metronome, whether they feel positive, negative, or neutral. Um, a lot of this kind of voluntary introspection, looking within and trying to describe the conscious experience. This book, Volker Psychology, went largely unread in the English tra translation until the 1980s. As a matter of fact, when my teacher in history of psychology uh, took this book out and he wrote a seminal article on Wundt, which we're all going to study if you take my history of psychology course next semester, um, uh, he found that only one person had taken this book out of the New York Public Library since the 1920s or 30s when it first appeared there. So this book was published, The Elements of Folk Psychology. The book was published in, did I put the date up here? 1917. And she, uh, it's usually about a year later. Well, it looks like it was published 1917 in German and or 17 in English, and he, he published it in German in 1912. So it, it takes a few years for things to get translated, especially before there were you know, computerized translation devices. So before I read some of the preface to you, I just want to give you some of the topics. Um, chapter So introduction on history and task of folk psychology, its relation to ethnology, analytic and synthetic methods of exposition, folk psychology as a psychological history, of the development of mankind. Uh, he then looks at primitive man. He looks at things like early philosophical hypotheses, the prehistoric remains, I have to make it a little bigger, remains, uh, Schweinfurth's discovery of pygmies in the upper Congo, the Negri Negritos of the Philippines, the inland tribes of Malacca, the Vedas of Ceylon, so different cultures. Um, culture and primitive man in its eternal expressions, dress, habitation, food, weapons discovery, the bow and arrow, acquisition of fire, relative significance of concept of the primitive, the origins of marriage and the family. He's going back into deep history of the human condition and looking at cultural and social aspects. Now, this is very different. Look, I, I'm telling you, until the 1980s, most people didn't even know that this that Wundt wrote this kind of stuff. In the preface, we'll see, and in throughout this book, he talks about things that were so outside of what people were thinking about in psychology at the time that he even said in this book that he felt 
that an academic experimental psychology should be limited to very basic ideas of perception, and that when it comes to the big things about spirituality, about social relationships, about social structures and mores and family structures and tribal structures, all these big cultural things, he said it should be left to the anthropologists, the theologists, so religion, and to philosophers. He said that psychology really was at a loss. It's, he said this level of social structure, even though he wrote about it, he said that it's too complicated for an experimental laboratory psychology. Now, what I just told you is key, because most folks that you talk with about Wundt have no idea of this aspect of Wundt, because this book has this book was relatively unread even to this day. Now, if you study history of psychology, or you have a professor who specializes in the history of psychology, or specializes in Wundt in particular, then you're going to they're going to know about this. It's no hidden secret that I'm revealing to you. However, most folks that you uh, encounter in our field don't know that this is that Wundt actually rejected the idea of an experimental academic psychology doing anything more than very kind of surface level perceptual stuff research. Let's look at a few more of the chapters in here. The totemic age, the word totem and its significance for cult, tribal organization, and institutional chief, chieftainship, tribal wars. The tribal ownership. So what is totemic, the totemic age, what does that mean? A totem is like a totem animal. It's a sacred animal. So in, um, in North America, there were uh, three tribes within the Lenape, tri the Lenape Indians of our area. The Lenape literally means the first man. I did a little bit of study on my own uh, on spiritual practices of the Lenape. And there were three tribes. There was a turkey tribe, a wolf tribe, the turtle tribe. Uh, there might be four. There might be an eagle as well, but um, I think it was just the three off the top of my head. Was it? <laughs> it's been a while. But these tribes, they had tribes that their totem animal was either the turkey, the turtle, or the wolf. So over in Delaware Water Gap area, on the Pennsylvania side, the main tribe totem animal was the wolf. On the New Jersey side, the totem, the tribe that was on the New Jersey side of the Delaware Water Gap over here, their totem animal was mostly the turtle. And this totem animal became to have some sort of spiritual significance to them that it was only, it was never killed, kind of like in Hinduism today, the cow is a sacred animal in India. So if you go to India and you walk on the streets, you not only will encounter cows, and the cows are given the right of way, but you also have to watch your step because even the cow flock patties are, are, are left untouched on the sidewalk. So you, you could be in the middle of, well, when I was there, it was called Bombay. <laughs> you could be in the middle of Bombay and walking, and you have to walk around the cow patties because these were, the cow was seen as a sacred animal. The totem animal of a tribe it were, were at earliest, as Wundt describes it, were um, the earliest ways of keeping uh, families from intermarrying within each other. So, so there were strict rules about having children, marrying and having children with people from within your tribe and outside of your tribe. Kind of like today, you wouldn't, uh, there, we have rules social rules about maybe marrying someone who's too closely related to you in your family, etc. But these are the origins in ancient times when explorers these like, that's what a totem animal is, a sacred animal. And these totem animals are often sacrificed and killed like at one special um, ceremony a year or something like this. And the only person that could say eat the meat would be the, the, the shaman or the chief and they would actually, the, the, the meat would be sacrificed and cooked, and that shaman or that, that uh, medicine man, the priest, the chief of the tribe, would eat that and um, would actually blow their breath into the fire that's cooking the meat, and their breath would transpire from the, from the spiritual, spirituality of the chief into the fire and into the meat, 
in Freud's book, Totem and Taboo, which is another really interesting look at culture from a psychoanalytic point of view, he discusses research in there. He also discusses Wundt's book, Walker Psychology. Freud read Wundt. He discusses in there a very fascinating practice whereby if the, if the chief blows into the fire, creating the embers to burn, and that, that fire burning goes into the meat, anyone else that eats that meat other than the, the chief themselves will become violently ill or will even have death occur. And we probably can experience this and know this as psychologists as a psychological phenomenon. We all understand the power of belief and <laughs> placebo from different things we've studied in this class. Uh, so this is looking into things that no one knew what it was looking into. It was in German, and the English translation was, was unread. Why was it unread, by the way? Why, why wouldn't people have been reading this? Well, there's a very simple answer to this. In German, the title of this book is, you, you know the, the car Volkswagen? Volkswagen means people's wagon. People's wagon, car, wagon. It's the car of the people. Volk means people. Um, what's his name? Wundt's book in German is not the principles of folk psychology. It's called Volker psychology. So in other words, it's people psychology. The English translation was folk psychology. Many of the academic psychologists of the time Remember, this is the era of 1913, John B. Watson, Behaviorism. This book's coming out in 1917, and the behaviorists are saying, who wants to read about folk wisdom? Social psychology wasn't, wasn't part of the American lexicon at this time. So people ignored it because they were interested in John B. Watson, and Behaviorism, and Learning Theory. Not in folk wisdom. <laughs> this was seen as like anthropology. Let's look at some of these other chapters. Um, the culture of the heroic age, folk migration and the founding of the states, plow culture. He goes through history and he talks about the psychology of different cultures, of different time periods, the origins of cities, the beginnings of legal systems, um, the differentiation of legal functions, cult practices. So early spiritual animism and things of this, the mysticism. Fascinating book. This, I mean, if you really want a good time, this book is a lot of fun to look through and see what he has to say. Uh, world empires, world cultures, world religions. So here we have uh, the psychology of religion. But another course that I've been teaching quite a bit over the past 10 years, psychology of religion, and we read this chapter as part of that class. And uh, so you get the, the, this, this concept here. So we're, I want to just go back to the preface and give you a little bit of a feel of, Wundt, uh, of Wundt's idea of what he's doing here. So this is the translator's note. But we want to hear what Wundt said from the very beginning. Uh, I was trying to get this on my Kindle, and I, it won't load on for some reason. But here's Wundt in his own words. I won't read the whole thing. I just want to give you the feel of... Now, this is before social psychology is an established field. And this is the father of European psychology describing what he is showing to be something that is beyond the scope of an academic experimental psychology. That's his conclusion. But he... But as a philosopher, he writes a whole book on, on this. But it's mostly what we call sociology today, or anthropology. The, this volume pursues a different method in its treatment of the problem of folk psychology. Now, when you see this word folk, you can think group, you can think people, you can think social. This is, these are different ways of translating the word Volker from German to English. Folk psychology from employed in many extensive treatments of the subject. Instead of considering success, successively the main forms of expression of the folk mind, the present work studies the phenomena so far as possible synchronous, synchronously exhibiting their common conditions and their reciprocal relations. 
Even while engaged on my earlier task, I had become more and more convinced that a procedure of this latter sort was required as its supplement. So what's he talking about here? He's talking about his earlier studies on things like the metronome and introspection and asking people how they're perceiving the color orange, things of this nature, his cognition, sensory cognition research. He said, I wanted to go beyond this. I wanted to, a psychology that was broader. And that's the result is this book. But this takes a different kind of thinking. He says, indeed, I believe that the chief purpose in investigations of social psychology must be found in a synthetic survey. The first prerequisite of such a survey is, of course, a separate examination of each of the various fields. The history of the development of the physical organism aims to understand not merely the genesis of the particular organs, but primarily their cooperation and the correlation of their functions. An analogous purpose should underlie an account of the mental development of any human community and finally mankind itself. In addition to the problem of the relation of sep the relations of separate processes to one another, cognitive processes, uh, however, we must in this case face also the broader question as to whether or not mental development is at all subject to law. So in other words, he's saying we have to look at the physical aspects the, of the, the cognition, how to think. But what we're really wondering is, is, this, is there some sort of lawful behavior in how human beings develop in the way they think? That's what he's saying here. And to this end, he wants to look cross-culturally, what we call cultural psychology today, or social psychology. That it is, therefore, in the subtitle of the present volume, is intended to suggest that we can be concerned only with outlines, moreover, and not with an exhaustive presentation of detail. Whoops. I got it. Be able to read this follows from the very fact that our aim is a synthetic survey. An exhaustive presentation would again involve us in a more or less detached investigation of single problems. A briefer exposition, on the, on the other hand, which limits itself to arranging the main facts along lines suggested by subject matter as a whole, is without a doubt better adapted to both present and clear picture of development. What he's saying here is you have to, this, you might hear this and read this and say, I don't understand a word of what he's gibber jabbering about, but if you if you once you become a uh, once you know what you're reading, it becomes easier easier. You have to sit back a little bit and chew on it a bit. And what he's saying here is psychology has been taking an up close look at things. Um, it's been zooming in, looking at cognitive processes, looking at introspection, the anti introspective method on how the mind voluntarily organizes perception into reality. That's Wundt's voluntarism. But what he's saying is, what's, what we're doing in this present volume and what's needed in psychology is not just a close-up shot, but a big picture psychology. And that's what he's proposing here. A big picture psychology, a cultural psychology, a social psychology, a psychology that goes from looking at an individual to looking at the group. And that's the foundation of social psychology. I just want to go to the last paragraph of, the, of this preface, because the last paragraphs usually have good juice. <laughs> they usually, it's usually the last paragraph where uh, things get... Uh, the hypothesis of folk psychology is just going to start in the middle of the last paragraph, just to give you another feel, of, uh, to kind of drive home for you all the incredible complexity and foresight of Wilhelm Wundt, which is very fun to think about. The hypothesis of folk psychology. So in other words, a hypothesis is an idea. The hypothesis of social psychology never refer to a background of things or to origins that are by nature inaccessible to exper experiential knowledge. They are simply assumptions concerning a number of conjectured empirical facts that, for some reason or another, elude positive detection. When, for example, whenever you're reading and you, you're saying, what the heck's going on? Read a little more, because oftentimes it explains itself. 
then you can go back and read again if you really have to know this stuff, you know. But there's a way, uh, don't get caught up in, in worrying about if you don't understand every word, because oftentimes as you go on, it reveals itself. It becomes, it's said in another way. Especially, this is a style, this was written in the early 1900s, a different writing style. It, it, you have to kind of put you in the mood of the time that it was written. Uh, some of the, the way things are described are as important as the description themselves. Um, when, for example, we assume that the God idea resulted from a fusion of the hero ideal with the previously existing belief in demons, this is a hypothesis since the direct transition of a demon into a God can nowhere be pointed out with absolute certainty. Nevertheless, the conjecture process moves on the factual plane from beginning to end. The same is true not merely of many of the problems of folk psychology, but in the last analysis, almost all questions relating to the beginning of particular phenomenon. So what he's saying here is you have to make some guesses here because we're going so far back in history, into prehistory, that we're just putting conjectures together. We're making educated guesses, and that's the best we can do. And this is why he also says that psychology in this book, that this is kind of beyond the scope of an, a purely empirical experimental laboratory psychology. How are you going to test for things, uh, for ancient peoples, thousands, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 years ago, 14,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago, how, uh, or even pre-homo sapien? How do you test for this? You don't know. Now, evolutionary psychology can make some guesses, but... He's saying that for this, we have to be a little looser with our with our our idea that this is going to be a laboratory science, this social psychology, or as he, the German was translated, Volker, folk psychology. That is to say, we are driven to that hypothesis, which is in greatest consonance with the sum total of the known facts of the individual folk psychology and of folk psychology. It, it, it is it is this empirical task. Constitu uh, constituting a part of psychology and yeah, at the same time an application of it that chiefly differentiates the psychological history of development. Such as the following work aims briefly to present from a philosophy of history. In my opinion, the basis of philosophy of history should henceforth be a psychological history of development through the, though the latter should not intrude upon the particular problems of the former. The concluding remarks of our final chapter attempt in a few sentences to indicate this connection of a psychological history of development with a philosophy of historical development as it appears from the point of view of general relations of psychology of philosophical, philosophical problems. What, what Vun is proposing here, uh, I'm not sure if you're far enough into the game of psychology yet, to really appreciate how brilliant he, what he is proposing here is. In this day, when you go to graduate school, or when you take a class here in undergraduate, you're going to take a class, say, in neuropsychology, biological psychology, or genetics, or evolutionary psychology, or personality theories, or something specific. And it's going to be like looking very close at things. And Vun is proposing a psychology that's a big picture, a broad psychology. I don't know where you get that today. I mean, there, I know the writers who write in this way. There's something called theoretical psychology. And theoretical psychologists write about big picture psychology. And there's also historians of psychology who write in this way. There's the philosophy of psychology. Um, so there, but these are all specialties that you probably will not encounter until deep in your graduate work. You'll get one course. And I don't know how, uh, this was the area of psychology that got me excited, thinking about why is psychology done this way? Why are we taking so, what, why is such a fascination in, in zooming in to the smallest detail. Why such a fascination in statistics? Why such a altar raising, why the altar raising, I'm, I'm even putting up on the grand altar of scientism, of experimentation, when there are clearly other things, other ways of doing things that have been successful. These, this, these ideas have always excited me.
it's amazing that in 1912, these ideas were kind of all having Wundt as well. So that little taste of Wundt in, as a real early component, exponent, uh, presenter, proposer of social psychology. But it didn't stick. No one knew about this Wundt until the 1980s. Late 1970s, the article came out, Arthur Blumenthal re-examining re Wundt. By the way, just for your, your knowledge, the reason no one knew this Wundt was because the person who, who translated most of Wundt's work was a guy named Edward Boring. He was a, that's, it's an unfortunate last name if you're a professor, Boring. He was a historian of psychology, but he was a behaviorist. So his multi-volume work, I think it was two volumes of the history of psychology, which was like the standard way of studying psychology, history of psychology through the 1970s, presented Wundt from a behaviorist perspective. And the behaviorist wanted to present Wundt in a light that supported their way of doing empirical psychology. It's politics. You can't get any more social psychology than this. This is it's a political act. It's shaping information in a way that supports an agenda and generations of undergraduate students and graduate students and professional psychologists were pumped out, um, indoctrinated into this way of thinking until one person, you usually find that these revolutions in thinking, as we've seen, cognitive revolution, etc., came from outside of psychology. You usually have to stop worshiping your field and be a, stand up against it, read outside of it, see what other people are saying, in order, and then you become like the figure in the field that transforms it, like Noam Chomsky, George Miller, real work nicer, Jerry Bruner, the cognitive revolution against B.F. Skinner and those guys. Okay, any uh, thoughts or ideas about anything you want to know about? I, I, I mean, it's a big 500-page work, so I can't answer questions off the top of my head for a lot of the book specifically, but there, is there anything general that you want to know about Wundt and Volk, Volk psychology? You already know more, more than most folks do about this. <laughs> about Even down to the word Volker, and the subtleties of what that, how that can be translated from the German to the English. Social, group, people. So this is, uh, again, free. That's Wilhelm Wundt, the elements of folk psychology. Uh, before we go to, to um, one, I want to show you this guy. Around the same time, 1898, this guy Norman Triplett. Uh, he's American, but he did it. He was he was an early psychologist, and he did a rather fascinating study that the athletes in here are going to love to hear about this. Triplett was looking at social facilitation. What is social facilitation? The musicians love this too. Social facilitation is the idea that we tend to perform better when there's someone else with us. So Triplett looked at bicycle racers. You know, velodrome racing. Madison Square Garden used to have velodrome, these big wooden tracks where the bicycles race around. Today they have them, it's an Olympic event, etc. And he found that cyclists would go out on this velodrome track and have excellent times when they ran, when they raced alone against themselves, you know, trying to make a good practice, a good, good lap, a good time on the on the course. Their times got better if there was someone next to them competing against them. It should make sense, kind of, if you're an athlete or something. But the idea that social facilitation is the idea that performance often increases when there's someone that is. Um, someone that is in spurring you on, like a competitor. And in sports psychology, which is a, a big field right now, performance psychology and sports psychology, you can, if you're doing like a time trial on your own, or if you're practicing or working on a skill, musician or sports or whatever it is, as you're working on this, if you can imagine that you're in competition, psychologically preparing yourself in that mental state, so practicing as if you are in a competition, an imaginary opponent, it actually increases performance on your 
practice session. You can do this as a musician as well, or an actor or an actress. We often say when you're practicing, close your eyes and imagine that you're, there's an audience out there. And when you're performing, close your eyes and imagine you're in your house, <laughs> all nice and quiet. Uh, so this is one of the first studies, and I put the link here that you can read. If you click on that, it takes you to the original study that he did. All the times of cyclists and how they increased when there was a second, third, and fourth cyclist on the track with them. So that's another big, now this is before social psychology is an established field, but it, it was a psychologist, an experimental psychologist in America who was looking at how the individual influences the group and how the group influences an individual, which is social psychology. Now, we keep going with this word context. This looks familiar because this is how I introduced, remember we did Gestalt theory many weeks ago? I can't give you an illustration that's any more illustrative of social psychology than this. The context, the context determines how we experience the phenomenon itself. So we see this apparent shift from light to dark in this bar. We know from seeing this before that this, this color empirically remains the same. What's actually shifted is the context, and the context is determining. You can imagine yourself. This is you in psychology class, and this is you at a frat party. <laughs> you know, this is, this is me uh, out with my family and friends, and this is me in class. I change d depending on the context. I'm, and so do all of we. This, there's no aspect of me that's any more authentic than the other, unless I'm trying here to look like I'm here. <laughs> you know, then we might call that phony or inauthentic. But basically, folks who say, who am I, suffer some sort of um, what a cognitive psychologist will read about. Festinger called, Leon Festinger called cognitive dissonance. This is when you feel this kind of weird feeling because you're acting in a way that you don't agree with in your moral sense or your ethical sense. Although we don't talk, they don't talk about morals and ethics in cognitive psychology. They call it cognitive dissonance. Your belief or your attitude is different from how you're finding yourself act. Maybe due to social pressures or something like that. Well, that can be understood maybe when you're trying to look or act in this shade when you're naturally in this shape, when your inner sense of self is in this shape. I'm making a stretch here, trying to. But this is the influence of Gestalt psychology. Most of the early social psychologists were Gestalt psychologists. Came from German speaking European countries to the United States and Canada, escaping German fascist, Nazis, persecution. So remember that context is everything. So this field of social psychology is not new. Now we have another very little known aspect of the origins of social psychology. Sigmund Freud. In 1921, remember Freud? All big on the unconscious. Now folks, his most famous book is called Civilization and Discontents. This is the one that if you take literature class or you take uh, some sort of cultural studies class, you read Freud's Civilization and Discontents. And this is, that's a prime example. Uh, it's a second to last book, I think. Moses and Monotheism, I think, was his final book, but which was a study of monotheistic religious experience. And we had Freud who starts in the beginning looking at ego and unconscious and conscious eventually adds a superego into this business. He's looking at internal psychodynamics and psychosexual conflicts. Remember the psychosexual state is all about anal power things. And by 1921, he's starting to look outside of the individual and he's looking at context. When I teach my course in social psychology, 
which I'll be doing in a few weeks um, during the winter break, I have the students read this. It's an upper level course, so they get. This is the group psychology and the analysis of the ego. I put a link there that you can link on it and read it online if you want to take a look at it. This book, you can get it anywhere. It's published. You see, it's a brand new published. Norton publishes it. I can't tell you why, but no one talks about it. And no one reads it for some reason. It's amazing. It's all about group psychology, the original, and the ego, and the individual. So it's how the group influences the individual and how the individual influences the group. Social psychology. Listen to the original uh, title in German. You ready for this? You're going to love this. Because you'll, you'll get that this is why this is interesting. Massen mm -hmm. psychology. I'm not good German pronounce it, pronounce it. Massen psychology. So that's psychology of the masses. Mass psychology und ich analysis. Now you remember, ego was Latin for ich. German word ich means me, myself, the I analysis. So this is literally mass psychology and analysis of the self. How the individual is affected by groups. It was translated into English, group psychology and the analysis of the ego. But this word, massen, if you go to the, there's a footnote here. Listen to this footnote in the introduction. It's so, the, the, translating words is so important to understanding what's really going on here. Group is used throughout the translation of this work as equivalent to the rather more comprehensive German mass, M-A-S-S-E, -S -S -E, like the mass, a mass of people, a group of people. The author uses this latter word to render both group and uh, um, the French word fool, F-O-U-L-E, uh, which more naturally be translated as crowd. Now, what is this book about? This little thin book I will venture to tell you that every major concept that's presented in a modern psych social psychology textbook can be found someplace in this slim volume, at least in a germ, in a seed, maybe not as developed, but Freud was on to something. What does Freud propose in this? Something that all of you are very familiar with. All of us, not just you, me too. The very odd thing that happens when we get into a group of people. On its most basic form, you're driving down the highway. Everybody's doing 80. They can't just pull me over. Some kind of weird thing happens until the state cop does choose to pull you over. You're the lucky one, you know. Um, and, you, and you look at the cop and say, well, they were all doing 80. And the cop doesn't care because you're the one who pulled over, not them. So somehow in our minds, we start to justify things. Well... It's almost like Freud proposes that the self, the ego, the I, as he says, the ich analysis, the I, the analysis of the self, when we're with a group of people, somehow becomes like debased, watered down, diffused against everyone. And on this very basic example that I'm giving, that we kind of think, well, how could I be held responsible? We're all doing it, you know. That is the key of something that goes much deeper. Think about. The, the things we read in the paper, recently I just read in the paper, of some of the really horrible things that occur, most recently at Cornell, with the, the initiation for fraternities and sororities, the, um, what do you call that, pledging stuff. The rituals that people go through in order to get into the group, the Cialdini talks a great deal about this, we'll look at this on Wednesday, Cialdini's idea, but Freud says that when you're in the midst of a group, especially a group that you elevate to some sort of sense that you desire belonging to, the more humiliating, the more degrading, the more, you might, might even say illegal, the more socially questionable the acts that you're asked to perform to become a member of that group, the more personally degrading the more you value being a part of that group. It's a fascinating thing to think about. In other words, it's almost like 
for those who haven't been through something like this, it's almost like you go to the store, you buy something you really want, you know you paid too much for it, you could have gotten it cheaper someplace else, and then you get the buyer's remorse a little bit, but you then come up with reasons to feel good about it. And the actual act of paying too much for something makes you like it even more than maybe you do really like it. <laughs> do you feel, I mean, have, have you all experienced that in some way that you kind of convince yourself, I've, I've done it as well, it's all this. This is the idea of the, the analysis of the ego. Uh, it's looking at how being a part of the crowd kind of, you end up doing things and acting in ways that you otherwise would not do. Um, you can look back in life. I think we, we you'll may do this now. Maybe when you get older, you'll do this as well. And you'll think things will suddenly pop into your mind from 30 years ago, 20 years ago. And you'll say, oh my goodness, I owe that person an apology. And then you really, it ha it'll happen. There's things you're going to do now that uh, 20 years from now you're going to regret and wish you would have done differently. But you also, one also learns to forgive themselves because we do the best we can, you know. But it's, it's like um, when you're in a certain part of life, you're in a certain aspect of life, you're in a certain group setting, a certain cultural setting, it's what's going on, you get caught in that flow of things. And the individual, Freud says, the individual ego gets diffused over the whole mass of people. And then we have things that take place like looting and rioting and uh, even in sporting events. You know when the folks are real fanatical about the team? Even if the team wins, they'll go out and trash cars and burn <laughs> cars up and flip stuff over. Uh, even if the team wins. Now how do you explain this? It's like a mass hysteria takes place. All this stuff, the, uh, listen to the chapters here. This book would take you an afternoon to read. It'll change your life. It'll, not change your life. It'll, I, I know, it's a little bit of hyperbole, but it'll change the way you look at things. Uh, listen to some of these chapters. Uh, chapter, where is it? Chapter one. So first he talks about this French book, which is the French Le Bon, which you can get for free online on archive.org, the website that I have linked to. His description of the group mind. So this predates, so a lot of Freud's idea come from McDougall and from um, Le Bon. Other accounts of collective mental life. Suggestion in the libido. Life and libido isn't only sex drive, it's the life force, it's the eros, it's the life, libido is like psychical energy. Uh, if you have low libido, it just doesn't mean you have low sex drive, like in today's terminology, but for Freud it's kind of like lethargy and low energy. Um, suggestion, Freud goes back to hypnotism, just like we studied hypnotism and how a, a third of the population, a quarter to a third of the population is hypnotizable. That number starts coming up again in Freud's text, and he turns to understanding hypnotism as a social phenomenon. Now, he, did, he uh, abandoned hypnotism as a therapeutic method, but he starts using it as a research method to understand how the psyche becomes diffused, the ego becomes diffused in a group. Um, two artificial groups, the church and the army. Now, this is very fascinating, especially if you watch the documentary on Jonestown. When you join a cult, you know the Jonestown Massacre, Jim Jones? Do you, do you know about Jim Jones? I put a great documentary I put on a slide that you can watch. We can't watch it in class because it's over an hour long. But when people get involved in cults, certain religious beliefs, something very similar to what happens when you get involved in the military takes place. What's the first thing that happens when you go into the military? They say you're done. You got it. And you know, because we've been talking about hair, this is the great marker of individuality. This is a statement in, of individuality. Her hairstyle, whether or not you're, you know, got the clean cut shade, you know, clean, clean cut look, or if it's Einstein now, or whatever it is, you John Travolta cut. <laughs> whatever it is, hair is the the 
single most important mark of individuality. When you go into the military, it shaved off. Event, individual, it's, it's taking away individual uniqueness. The same thing happens in a cult. You want to diffuse, you want to dis dis disconnect the person of having any type of like individuality. And they want, you want that ego to diffuse into the group. So Freud goes on to talk at great length about the similarities between religious practices. Uh, he's talking here, as you know, in most religious faiths, if you become a monk or a priest, you, um, there are rules about shaving the head and wearing all the same uniform, just like in the military, you wear a robe or some sort of, you take all these individual factors away and you, the, the ego becomes consumed or, or um, debased into a group whole. The individual starts seeing the group instead of the individual. So he makes discussion of church and love, the loss of individuality. How about Further problems and lines of work, so he goes into other professions, and well, there's certain professional things that you dress in a certain way, you speak in a certain way, a certain decorum uh, that one does. For example, in professional life, you all now know in college, I, I think that one of the biggest things that I've seen is when younger folks are coming in and maybe not used to using email, used to text messaging, and now in professional life and in college life, email is, you're primarily, you're not texting with your professors, you're emailing with them. And there's a certain decorum that is there. And this decorum is a, 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 a carryover from the days when you'd write, hand write a letter. You always have a greeting. You always have, there's a certain, uh, decorum you use and how you talk with them. You, you use more formal tone. If, you know, in English, we don't have a formal versus an informal use of language like in Spanish. But you, you take a more formal tone. You also always sign it with a salutation. Thank you, etc. And then your name. And somewhere your full name, right? And um, these are all certain group practices that if you don't do them, uh, it could have consequences. And those consequences might range in various things, but I guess most important is you, you, you want to, it's like making a gesture to show your willingness to participate and be a part of a group rather than, you know, doing your own thing. Uh, so it, in, it's, so he talks about problem, lines of work, et cetera. Identification, he does a chapter on this. What is identification? Remember the defense mechanism of identification? This is when you become, you lose the, the ego, yourself becomes diffused, becomes debased into a sports team, a brand of clothing, a, a, some kind of symbolic uh, image that your uh, lifestyle, J. Crew or something like this, you know, or a religious belief or patriotism, the individual who loses themselves and their identity becomes whatever that other thing is, their, their nationality, their nationalism, their sports team in, a, in fanaticism, in a more of an evangelical kind of religious experience, it would be their, their religion. Um, he talks then about being in love and hypnosis. This is where Freud talks. You, you all know that loopy feeling of being in love? <laughs> oh my goodness. This, Freud calls it psychosis. Here he, he draws, this is a fun chapter because he talks about being in love is like getting hypnotized. You don't recognize yourself when you're in love. Oh, you're going out and you're buying $400 gifts for your love. <laughs> and you do it all kind of stuff that you then one day when reality hits, you say, what on earth was I thinking? <laughs> it's psychosis. It's a sickness, Freud said. And he's not talking about love as in generativity. You remember the gen genital stage of genitiv generativity? To love and to work. To 
have a child, to love one another, to support them. You know, this is that loopy kind of crazed old, he's so dreamy, <laughs> irrational stuff. And he likens it to being hypnotized and also psycho psychotic. That's in chapter 8. Chapter 9, the herd instinct. What is the herd? It's the crowd. It's when the mob starts doing something and everybody gets caught up in it and suddenly rocks are going to be thrown through windows and get them, they're different. Hang them, kill them. You know, all this kind of uh, um, very kind of primitive, primal. Um, there's another psychoanalyst, Wilhelm Reich, and he calls racism this belief in nationalistic and racial kind of superiority that happened in Nazi Germany and happens in the United, happened in the United States. Um, he calls this mystic genetics. Genetic mysticism is the term he used. I had it backwards. Genetic mysticism. It's a weird kind of mixture in someone's experience of having, think about it, it conjures up kind of poetical feel. Genetic mysticism. Now think to yourself about these crystal knock and these nighttime Ku Klux Klans where the anonymity is there. There's a hood over the face. They're all part of the group. They're all dressed in the same uniform. There's no individuality except the grand leader who might be in a bright red hood, you know, and they're burnt. They're carrying torches and burning crosses. And there's like this ancient kind of mystical uh, mysticism rooted in some kind of idea of genetic purity. Now that's some deep stuff when you're thinking about what's going on psychologically in this. What fulfillment is taking place. Freud talks about the group and the primal horde, which is much of what I was just describing. Uh, yeah, so this little book is packed full of incredible stuff. If you want to have a fun, interesting read, or maybe you'll get the opportunity to write a paper in another class and you want to find something that's really unique, that you're, you're going to stand out, maybe it's maybe they're going to tell you to write something on social psychology or something, don't forget this book. You will be remembered, <laughs> and it'll be fun to, to read. So this is another element of the beginnings of social psychology. I'll, I'll pass this, this around to you all. Don't steal it now. I know it's exciting. <laughs> Any questions about that? So we have social psychoanalysis, and it still exists to this day. Eric Fromm, one of the most exciting psychoanalysts that I've studied, is a social psychoanalyst. He doesn't look at individuals, he looks at culture. He puts culture on the couch and analyzes culture. Slavoj Žižek is a Lacanian psychoanalyst. And he looks at ideology. What is ideology? Whatever it is that you believe in deeply, that you know in your heart that if everybody felt this way, everything would be okay. And you might not push it on people, but he does it. That's ideology. Capitalism is an ideology. Socialism is an ideology. The Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition is an ideology. Judeo-Christian and Islam are three ideologies within themselves, but they also happen to be a collective ideology that build upon one another. Buddhism is an ideology, or at least it's an ideology, but it's also, an, at its core, an attempt to escape ideology. But the funny thing is that trying to lose your ego is the biggest ego trip going. <laughs> so um, if we look at um, just a little... If we look at um, early forms of social psychology in the United States, we come to a guy named Kurt Levine. And now you see his name up there. It looks like Lewin, and you're going to hear pronounced Lewin. I used the pronunciation he used, which is the German pronunciation, which is Levine. Uh, don't become confused if you hear. It's except most people say Lewin in the United States. So if you hear Kurt Lewin, you know who it is. And it's up to you how you pronounce it. Um, I learned Levine, and that's what I stick with. Kurt Levine was a Gestalt psychologist. He was a German Jewish philosopher, psychologist. 
And he came to the United States in the early, early, when Hitler first, when fascism first came into power before they were doing the, 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 the naughty stuff, the bad stuff. Uh, the people who were really intelligent knew what Hitler was about to get up to. Because he wrote a book telling everybody that when he was in prison, he wrote a book called Mein Kampf, which outlined everything he intended to do once he had power. So when Hitler came into power, one of the first things he did was rule, he, he made it illegal to be a professor if you were Jewish. Why? Because firstly, most of the intellectuals in Germany at this time were Jewish intellectuals, because the Jewish way of growing up was deeply rooted in rabbinical studies, in a deep tradition in reading texts and interpreting what we call hermeneutics. In other words, the Jewish people were highly, highly intellectually well-read people who knew how to think critically because of how they, how they were brought up in the, the Jewish rabbinical schools, the Jewish tradition. So these folks were often professors, head of philosophy departments, head of psychology departments, etc. And Hitler wanted them out. Why? Because they had an audience. And Hitler didn't want what they were teaching to be polluting the wells of German youth, the German intelligence, intelligence the intellectual class, the young college students. So the first thing that went, all the Jew, Jew, Jewish professors were forbidden to teach in German universities. So they left and they came to the United States. Some of them, all their records were destroyed. They came here, and the only record there was that they were even had a PhD or that they were a professor was if they had published something that was in a library at the university where they could say, see, that's me. With the PhD, because the Nazis destroyed all, could you imagine, you work, you get your Master's degree, undergraduate, your PhD, you do research, you're a professor, and all your transcripts are destroyed. All record of you being a professor or having a doctor or any of that stuff is just destroyed, it's gone. And the only evidence that's left is if you publish something and it happens to be in a library in the country where you're at. That's how many of these folks ended up getting university positions without their transcripts or diplomas. Look, Kurt Levine came to the United States and he was asking one big question. How is it well, he had, he had two, a couple of big questions. But the big question he had is, how is it that people were getting so caught up in this authoritarianism, in this leadership where someone really sets down the rules and, and makes things um, big consequences if you don't follow the rules. An authoritarian regime. And he wanted to compare this to other things, other political ideologies that were flying around like he was in the United States. He wanted to look at democracy. Now what's the difference between democracy, thank you very much, yeah. what's the difference between democracy and authoritarianism, fascism? In authoritarianism and fascism, you are compelled to act, to believe, to think in a certain way. Because the group is more important than the individual. If you can think that in some ways looking to the group might be a, a more socially responsible way of living, like if you think of others and not just think of yourself, now that's a positive thing. I think we'd all agree that there's something that that's a positive idea to be empathic and caring enough not to be narcissistic and only for yourself. But if you're sacrificing yourself for the sake of the other, in other words, if you're doing things that are harmful to yourself in sacrifice for the group, that is the danger of fascism. In fascism, you look towards the fatherland, the motherland, the state, becomes like the mother or the father. You see this now in North Korea. You see it in China. And you used to see it in Soviet Union. And now you're seeing Vladimir Putin. If you watch the news, and you'll see this. Vladimir Putin still conducts himself like an old Soviet fascist ruler. 
but communist dictator like Stalin, but it's under democracy and it's under the idea that there's a democracy, but he's, it's kind of only on the surface level of democracy. Now there's another, now maybe some of, when you're younger, this is a very appealing idea, anarchy, the anarchistic state. This is something that you usually is very interesting in your 20s, and then by the time you get in your 30s, you, you realize it's not everything you thought it was. And this is the idea that if everyone was just allowed to do whatever they want and govern themselves, there wouldn't be so many problems. It turns out that doesn't work so well. So Kurt Levine wanted to test in a laboratory these three styles of government. Authoritarian style, fascism, Hitler and Mussolini and Stalin. He wanted to look at the, the capital, I'm sorry, the, the democratic system, which is the American system where people get involved and vote in their leader and choose their leader, they're participants in this thing. And he wanted to look at laissez faire governments, anarchists. And he wanted to see which, how, what, not only which was the most effective, but how did the people look? Like, what happened when you governed in this way? So there's a video here I'm going to show you. And in 1938, Kurt Levine comes into Gestalt Psychologist. He comes into um, the United States, and he goes into a YMCA. And he, he sets up a study where he's teaching children. And he puts these children into three groups. Fortunately, he filmed everything. Today, everything's filmed. This was pretty ahead of its time. We have the actual footage from the study in 1938. Silent film, but it's it, we can watch it. In one condition, he sets up three conditions. In one condition, you'll see the teacher, the leader, come into the classroom. And now I want you to think to yourself about high school and even college right now. And this teacher comes in, three button vest, suit, tie up to the thing, maybe the hair's combed, <laughs> and very kind of rigid. And he's the authoritarian. Look at him, giving everybody the eye. <laughs> you know there's no smiling. No. He's serious business. He's coming around. He's the teacher who's looking to see what you're doing on the computer. <laughs> you see, this is an imposing kind of figure. What are you doing? Points off. Points off. <laughs> he, he gets into the front of the room, and he says, class... Today we are going to be making uh, plaster casts of a uh, foot, a foot, and he gives us what the task was. These are little kids, but you know he's over, he's in control, there's no fooling around. And these kids, they step in the line real quick, they, they're scared to death, because this guy means business. You'll see when he walks in. If you look, it's the state police, when they get out of the car or on the, on the highway, what do the state police do? Do you notice these state cops? They don't come over to the car and say, hi, how you doing today? Um, have a nice day. Can I see your license and registration, please? That's not how they act. I watch them. They get out of the car and they do this kind of stuff. And they walk over to the car like this. And they have the hat and the thing. That, it's a very militaristic, the state cops I'm talking about. It's a very kind of militaristic presence. And they're st standing like this with the car. You know, it's like a, an aggressive kind of serious pose. You don't get the feeling that these are your friends. And there's reasons for this. The mirrored glasses where you can't see the eyes. Very effective. I'm always cautious when people have mirrored glasses. People in general. And something, I want to be able to see your eye. I'm also very cautious with another authoritarian move, completely tinted windows where you can't see. It's a power move. It's an, it's a, it's an act of perceived intimidation to another. Because there's, it's like the mirrored glasses. There's mystery. What's going on in here? There could be various reasons for doing this, but I'm talking about the social perception of this. So this person, this teacher walks in, and it's very authoritarian. It's very rule. He tells the students, this is what we're going to do. We're going to make plaster casts of your feet today. You, Donna, are you listening? You're going to be mixing the plaster. Omar? Pop, pop, chop, chop. You're going to make the wooden frame that we're going to pour the pasta in. Jaden, you're going to organize everybody to take off their shoes and their socks and keep their shoes and socks organized. T, 
Tea, are you listening? You, you better be listening. <laughs> you see, I can't laugh though. You are going to let me know if anybody's misbehaving. And you come and report to me. You see, all these things, and these kids, you'll see on this footage that, that he's telling each person has a signed role. Well, these kids, they're like chop chop. They're like really worried about, they're doing their job. Everybody's doing their thing. There's no chit chatting, there's no fun, there's no enjoyment. It's serious. When the researcher re leaves the room for a moment, all of a sudden, the kids start to do naughty things, and then there's an informant that tells the teacher behind back, just like happened in the Soviet communist countries. People on the state informing each other, just like what happened in our culture when paranoia became very big about terrorism and people started reporting each other. Things of this nature, watch out for un-American activities, things of this nature. This kind of paranoia set in. So that is one group, and you'll see the video footage. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. The second group, whole different group of children, same teacher comes in, but this guy, he comes in, takes off his jacket, opens up his tie, sits down, barely interacts with the kids, opens up his newspaper, he's really sitting back. He's the laissez-faire anarchist. Anything goes. He's the cool teacher, you know? And he says, ah, kids, uh, let me do whatever you want. <laughs> He says, there's some plaster, why don't you make some foot plaster casts, you know, your feet. This was the cast. And he sits and largely he ignores them. These kids go on, as you'll see in the video, and they're having a great time. They're throwing stuff at each other, plaster and stuff like this. They're throwing their shoes. One kid smeared it all over himself. And the teacher just doesn't care. Third group, Kurt, Le Kurt Levine, leadership style study. Third group, he's the Democratic guy. He comes in, he's the American president. He's been elected. And in America, everybody works together. You know? He takes off his jacket, he rolls up his sleeves, he opens, and he gets down like the girl who's the waitress at the Outback Steakhouse. She, they got their baseball hat on. What can I get you? <laughs> that kind of thing. Hey kids, what are we gonna do together today? Anybody have any ideas? And just like it's true in most Democratic ideas, the teacher already knows what's going to be done, but he floats the idea like somebody's going to, and, and Julia has an idea, and Avina has an idea, and Nehemiah has an idea, and they're all well, thinking, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? And everybody's getting into it, and then he says, oh, what about foot cast? And so he says, yeah, let's do that. Do you see, he already has, he knows where the direction's going, but he's given the illusion that there's participation. And then he says, who wants to mix the plaster of Paris? Who wants to do that? Who would like to mix that? And he's, oh, me, me. You know, okay, you do it. And who wants to make the wooden frame? You see, this is different than him commanding who's going to do it. And he doesn't mind that there's, you know, baseball game on the computer or whatever. He, he doesn't care. He's just, he wants to keep the vibe going. And he's even getting his hands dirty, mixing plaster of Paris. You're going to see this on, this on this clip. Well, what do you think the results are at the end of this study? Kurt Levine. This is the this is the first really big gestalt social psychology research study. What do you think the, the results are? Well, let's, let's judge it on two things. Which group do you think had the most fun? The laissez-faire, anything goes group, the democratic group, or the authoritarian group? Which group the kids had the reported having the most fun, the best time. Hey, that was swell. In the 30s, they would probably say that. <laughs> that was swell. Any ideas? What do you, what do you guess? I guess you mean, oh, the Democratic group. Do you think the Democratic group? Because you've been indoctrinated. You grew up in America. This is where you, you've been indoctrinated. <laughs> it's the only place that fun times happen. Anything goes. Yeah, anything, the anything goes. Why? Because they're throwing stuff at each other. There's no rules. It's a good time. Who had the least fun? The authoritarian group. The kids, the ones where the pet overbearing teacher was, was uh, coming down hard on everybody, telling everybody exactly what to do. The democratic group, it was okay. They didn't have a bad time, they didn't have a good time. It was just, it was all right, you know. Which group made the best product? Which one came up like they, they were all making the same thing? 
Which one had that superior, like quality, highest quality product at the end? What do you think? Wasn't the Anarchy Group. They got like nothing right. Wasn't the Democratic Group either. The authoritarian fascist group. They had the most highest quality product done. They also had the highest rates of paranoia and unpleasure and, and things of this nature in this study. That's the Kurt Levine leadership style. Stuff. So are, is America democracy, right? Mm -hmm. um, so then that, would, you, would you say that that's how we are? That there's just an in-between of just everything? Nothing and something? Well, that would be an argument. I mean, uh, as far as quality of things, who? I mean, I could just show something off the top of my head, and we'll see. When you think of the highest quality longevity automobile, what do you think of? This is a little risky nowadays because everything is not made in the image of where it's supposed to come from. But traditionally, who makes the best, most reliable automobiles? Anyone? I guess right now I'm going to say Tesla. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah well, I don't know if they're known as the most reliable. <laughs> they just had a major recall. Yeah, I <laughs> but I mean the ones that are they go forever. Acura, Ford, Ferrari, Volkswagen. This is interesting. Okay, Ethan, I don't know why you said Volkswagen, but yes, and Volkswagen, of course, is a German company that was started by Hitler. Yeah. <laughs> so this was uh, under fascist rule. And the joke is, in in uh, Woody Allen's movie Sleeper. It takes place in the future. They go, they they wake up like a thousand years in the future. They go in a cave and there's a Volkswagen Beetle from the '60s in there, and it starts right up. You know, and this is the joke about Volkswagen, Mercedes, BMW. Now it's also true of Volvo, which is a Swedish car. But usually, these German engineering was known to have longevity and things of this nature. When I I don't know if this is relevant today because no one wears watches, but when you think of like watches, what are the highest quality, most precision watchmakers in the world? I wonder, anyone, does this resonate with anyone? It's usually a Swiss watch, like Rolex or something. It's a Swiss watch, Swatch, is a Swiss watch. So the, they're known for like this quality. So these were this, these, these ideas that the highest quality products usually came from these more authoritarian, Germany was an authoritarian example of this. Uh, in a democracy, stuff is okay. Ford isn't known to be the greatest car for longevity. You usually can't afford it. lasts about 100,000 miles and you have to trade it in for something new. Whereas traditionally, like a Mercedes or a Volvo or a BMW, something like that, you would drive with 300,000 miles on it. Or today a Toyota, a Japanese car. Again, that's a more collectivist culture. Things have, sh have switched in, in this idea. So I hope that answers your question about it. But this, the, the thing to know about in 1938 when Kurt Levine came here as a Gestalt psychologist, the interest was which form of government was the best form of government? Which form of teaching in the classroom was the best for the classroom? And you can take this, and you can, maybe you had teachers in your mind. Uh, I, I mean, there are certain instances. If you're teaching a group of young people, you have to have a certain dynamic of authoritarianism or if you're teaching like a, a group of kids that are don't know how to behave, <laughs> you know, you have to have an authoritarian style in order for that to have any kind of order in a classroom. But if you're doing that, there's a cost to it. If you're if you're more concerned with the with the people following the rules than with learning, there's a cost to that approach. Uh, I this is kind of relevant. I had a second grade teacher, and he started out, he sent out emails with parents saying the first two weeks he was going to be very authoritative, yeah, um, and yeah. then afterwards he switched to more of like a democratic style, yeah. per se, and in the first two weeks I was absolutely terrified of the teacher, but then yeah. afterwards he switched over to a different teaching style, I don't know. Donna, this is classic, the, your, that teacher had a lot of wisdom. In the beginning teaching, and this also includes professoring, <laughs> professors come in. The first time professors come in and teachers, and they have the idea, I'm going to be everybody's friend. I'm going to be their pal. Call me by my first name. That kind of business. 
That lasts about two semesters. And they realize, oh, there's a reason that it's doctor or professor or whatever the title is. This person's your Mr. or Mrs. Um, it's easier to start out hard, authoritarian, and loosen up two weeks into it. Two weeks is the magic number. Somebody was right on with what you described. It's, you can go in and set a precedence and then loosen up, but you can't go in loose and then tighten up. It doesn't work. Time and time again in a classroom, it doesn't work. So um, that's, you'll find as you're in college, you'll find that the, usually the first two weeks are a little intimidating. It also is a way to root, root people out. I intentionally, in my classes, not here, but in my classes, uh, the syllabus is released um, a month ahead of time. So right next week, the syllabus for the winter class will be open. For, for the, and when they, the students have access to the syllabus for social psychology, the class will drop by about a third because they see what the demands are of the class. The amount of reading they have to do, the amount of writing they have to do, and all this stuff. And it saves me a lot of hassle because it... The who's going to stay are the ones who are willing to do the work. The ones who are going to be a pain <laughs> to themselves and to me, they're going to remove themselves. And that's probably the wisest thing for them to do. If they know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's serving as an act of fairness. It's in, but sometimes you do little things that make it look worse than it's going to be just to set that, that uh, dynamic in the class because then it, it so there's ways, this is great you brought this up. I wasn't, I wasn't anticipating talking about that. But you can, with this, do you want to see Levine's uh, footage? Here is, again, you can watch these. Here's the original footage. The importance of social atmosphere is evident in the thought and action of every individual. The character of the culture and the atmosphere of the family mold the personality of the growing child. The atmosphere in the classroom and workshop deeply affect the character of the work. The purpose of this experimental study, undertaken by Ronald Lippitt, was to test the effect of group atmosphere on the conditions which would permit insight into the underlying forces. So, if you see his sleeves... Four boys' up. clubs were formed from different classes. From eager volunteers, five members were selected for each club, so that the pattern of friendship and leadership was about the same for each club. These boys were 10 to 11 years old. They met one hour every week with their adult leader. It's even making foot castings. Three distinct social clients were created. The first of these was democratic. You see the teacher's very involved. He's down on the floor with them. His sleeves are rolled up. In the democratic atmosphere, there was group planning and adult cooperation. The children were free to choose what to do and with whom to work, but the planning was done cooperatively and by majority decision. The second social climate was one of autocracy. Autocracy is authoritarian. In the autocratic atmosphere, the direction was entirely in the hands of the adult. Notice he determines what was to be done on. and which children should work together. His body language there was no is rigid. Long range planning. The children were instructed from step to step in a friendly but determined manner. It's kind of like watching what's going on, overlooking. In the third group, an atmosphere of laissez faire prevailed. Laissez -faire. Let in the laissez faire change. atmosphere, there was individualistic freedom with a minimum of adult participation. These unrehearsed motion pictures document the activities of the clubs and are offered as illustration, not as scientific proof. The Democratic Club called itself the Dick Tracy Club and made a coat of arms. Most of the boys are sitting together discussing what to do today. Various suggestions are made. Different long-range plans are discussed in detail. The boy on the left is engaged in a specific project. But when the group votes, he is asked to give his consent. Voting. 
two boys at the right have started a friendly scuffle, which breaks up quickly. A certain amount of forced play is typical for the healthy child of that age. You're allowed a little bit of flexibility. Boys have too much. to make plastic footprints, and all have volunteered to be cast. Now they're all busy. The boy in the middle has just made a cast of his foot. Everyone is interested and active. The boy at the left is still sawing, and in the background, three boys and the leader work as a group. The Democratic leader participates as a regular fellow. He gladly gives technical advice, but only if asked. He carefully avoids any domineering behavior. I found that over the past 20 years, at the right of boy is mixed. Boy at the left is sawing. There are certain boy in black in the rear is also sawing. And you notice he's very persistent. Uh, in which work proceeds with much fun. I have found myself Small having to be one working of alone three, or in teams. A spirit of cooperation is maintained. There's some group Ideas are where exchanged I can freely. be democratic, like we are in here, because there's the dynamic is very agreeable. There's not a there's no one. Sometimes you have people who are in a classroom and they're, they're when the in trouble leaves, and they don't want to test whether his presence affects the behavior. These democratic boys continue their work without loss of interest. The teacher themselves can create the dynamic. So in other words, at the end of the hour, everybody, you, including the leader, you, participates spontaneously in the In my field. experience, if you come in with uh, uh, an attitude of, Okay, I have a job to do. As this our other credit club, we present the my job to do to teach, but, but there's an uh, uh, attitude of res mutual respect. In this other credit atmosphere, boys well, react to do two respect. ways. That sets up either by time. aggression but or by obedient in, submission. The, the teacher, like if you're in the first place, the boys were somewhat rebellious against their being and rigid, showed much aggression against rules, their rules, fellows. Rules. I don't want On this, I don't want one that. One boy was made the scapegoat and the mother of much hostility. In other groups, it's the same degree of autocracy less to obedient submission, a kind of classroom. And it also tells the students the secret that agents the professor show the typical the characteristic of the submissive reaction to autocracy. Than in learning. This uh, is the beginning of a meeting. Dependent and have to say, you know, well, that's not the boys sit around, do this, but waiting for the leader to arrive and breeds contempt and resentment, which will, will poison the whole group. Um, do you know what else is interesting? Well, it's, I'm, you're watching this authoritarian here, but what else is interesting is sometimes if you have a, in a class, a leader um, arrives, college immediately students, starts to drink. The boys follow orders without discussion. He the leader stands, supervises, but does not participate. You see how these he kids are snapping forward. to action? They're, they're so afraid. Um, so if you have a student that kind of like right needs help is doing aid. something to provoke, yeah, not give a like sometimes you'll get, you, you all have another classes, point. And there's probably a student you know who's doing stuff to provoke the professor maybe, or to look Leader for, sees to us and every um, detail is carried if out you right. let that interfere, so you have everybody to constantly, is you have to constantly be thinking of a greater group, as intensively as and you might be steaming inside to want to nail this person put them in their place, but you can't do it. Because it'll poison the class, it'll poison the whole atmosphere. So there's a very summary in here right now doing something. And if, they wish and if I would become authoritarian in front of the whole classroom and humiliate that person and come and down and look hard, it's going to affect the entire dynamic of the classroom. It shifts from a very positive, oh, we're going to psychology class, to, oh, no, that class. You know, this heaviness. So the, Everybody in my experience, step by step, the way around it is you have to talk to five days. You just, and you kindly and, and respectfully say, listen, this really isn't a good idea to do this. This but might look like do, modern you school, on like this, but you'll now see what lies like the beneath the dynamics. surface. The leader will leave the room. Look at this guy's body language. <laughs> so you get the point of, uh, the of Kurt Levine. You can watch remember this. remember that in democracy, work went on as intensively as ever. In uh, democracy, work continues for a few moments. Two boys at the left, so this is uh, Kurt Levine actually now, wrote a great book on resolving social conflicts that is gaining popularity right now in certain marginalized communities. Uh, so marginalized community is it, it, it shifts depending on where you are. For example, in South Africa in the 70s and 80s, the marginalized community was not the majority. The majority people population were 
black South Africans, but they were marginalized by a minority of Dutch Western white Europeans, and that was called apartheid. So a marginalized is not, you, you, we don't really talk anymore by more minority and majority, we talk about marginalized and centralized power structures. And um, right now, Levine is like making this huge comeback uh, because marginalized communities, whatever, wherever that is, largely in North America and in Europe, it's not so popular right now in South America, but are read, reading, resolving social conflicts by Kurt Levine, his book on social conflicts, and how to um, deal with power structures that are creating a, a marginalized and centralized power structure within a political system, social system. Us versus them stuff, you know? Us versus them. All right, any questions or thoughts? Um, the only person we didn't get to in the history is someone I'll tell you about very quickly. Do you remember Gordon Allport? Remember Gordon Allport? He wrote all the traits, the 18,000 adjectives, personality theory, Gordon Allport, trait theorist. Well, Gordon Allport is known as the father of American experimental trait personality theory, the person. His brother is Floyd Allport. Floyd Allport wrote the first American academic experimental social psychology textbook. And this is crazy. These two brothers, Gordon Allport, is the American father of trait personality theory. His brother, Floyd Allport. And uh, I, if you click on the link, you can go to the textbook. We don't have time to look into it now. Read the preface. See what it's all about. Look through the chapters like we did with the Wundt book. And you'll see some of these earliest origins of social psychology. So that is, I think we're out of time, but that is the history of social psychology. And hopefully you take from that that there's social psychoanalysis. Gestalt theorists, Gestalt psychologists were really the founders of contextual social psychology. And the difference between social psychology and empirical behaviorism, materialistic neuroscience, biological, and rational cognitive psychology. And next time, next class, we're going to look at the big historical experiments. We're going to look at Stanley Milgram's shock study. We'll look at Philip Zimbardo's, um, well, the other things here, Philip Zimbardo's prison study, and these other topics, bystander effect persuasions. Questions or thoughts? Hopefully, that gives you a good feel of social psychology. All right, I'll post the open test tomorrow. I'll go home and make it tonight. And Write some questions for you and make it available. You all take it and do well, okay? Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.